ethics is interesting because it's about how humans ought best live our lives. And as moral agents, we have to figure out uh, what the best way to, to live our lives and, 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 and how to deal with interpersonal relationships, as well as our relationships with the natural world. So because humans are the subject matter of ethics, um, the possibilities are limitless. And, uh, and uh, there's never a dull moment uh, 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 discussing ethics with students. Environmental ethics is interesting field because it's relatively new in the Western intellectual tradition. Um, for 2,500 years from Socrates clear up into the 20th century, it was taken for granted that the subject matter of ethics, the, the beings worthy of moral consideration were human beings and human beings only. Mm -hmm. And it was only uh, until the 1970s that that dogma was questioned. Um, first by uh, Peter Singer and, and, and the animal rights movement, and then later um, by uh, other philosophers who argued for uh, uh, positions that all life, uh, not just animals, but all living things are worthy of moral consideration and even entire ecological systems. So within the context of the history of the Western intellectual tradition, the fact that ethics would be broadened in scope to include non-humans is a startling uh, development. And it's only happened in the last 35 years uh, out of 2,500 year history. So uh, it, it's, it's a new, it's, it's a relatively new field, and an, it's an exciting field. Out of those positions, uh, animal rights, I find, resonates with students the most. Um, I mean, you know, the origin, the philosophical origins of that movement go back to 1975, but there is something about factory farming and vegetarianism and veganism that really resonates with the students. Uh, uh, you know, now in, in, in 2011. So um, I think there's a consciousness that is uh, developing about uh, the moral considerability of other sentient beings, um, primarily barnyard animals and how we treat them and factory farming. Well, uh, like Socrates, what motivates me to teach is the possibility of corrupting the minds of the youth. No, it is that um, uh, students are always interesting to come in contact with, and no two students are the same. Uh, the faculty here at UVU probably uh, uh, tends to think, and, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this uh, a bit, we, we tend to think of the student body as one homogenous canvas. And, and, the, and these, these people that come into our classrooms were all run off the same Xerox machine, right? Mm -hmm. Just mass produced and they all think alike, and they all go to the same church, and so on and so forth. And when you get to know the students, you find out that that is amazingly false. And uh, that the amount of diversity here at Utah Valley University, a school that you wouldn't think would have much diversity, there is a lot of diversity here. And uh, so as I tell my students uh, all the time, I just said this yesterday, I have the greatest job in the world. I'm underpaid and I'm underappreciated, uh, but uh, I get a talk about subject matter that, that, that I think is fun. And um, 
and, and to turn the students on to the wisdom of the Western intellectual tradition is, is, is greatly uh, gratifying to me. Uh, um, you know, there is the old complaint that philosophy is the study of old dead guys. Uh, what could that possibly have to do with every uh, you know, contemporary life? And every single time I go through Kant or I go through Mill or Nietzsche or Augustine or Plato, the students themselves always make connections between what they were talking about and current public policy issues now in the state of Utah in the county of Utah in the year 2011. Um, so uh, technology is, is, is creating new problems for us all the time. And uh, so there's always new problems to wrestle with. There's never a dull moment. No, nothing, nothing is ever the same. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the other thing is, um, groups of students in classrooms have a synergy and you never know what that is going to be and the students don't either I mean they 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 don't know me and they don't know one another and there are some classes that turn out to be more than the sum of its parts and there's a dynamism that comes alive uh, that is unexpected. Uh, and I always misjudge classes at the beginning of the semester. I think this class seems kind of dead. You know, the students don't really seem engaged. Uh, but this other class, I think that one has more potential. And oftentimes the reverse turns out to be true. And once we get going in the semester, um, a class that I thought was uh, kind of disengaged and uninterested turns out to be really uh, lively and uh, and animated in the conversation. Um, but <clears throat> no two classes are ever the same. And so, you know, I've taught here 15 years, uh, two semesters a year. I've taught 30 semesters. Um, every experience has been different. And that's one thing I love about teaching at Utah Valley University. It's confusing when, when somebody says, I, prom I, I support the liberal arts model of education. Um, you might think that what they're talking about is the humanities and the fine arts, but the liberal arts include the natural sciences, um, biology, geology, chemistry, physics. Why is that? Because those theories in natural science are artifacts of human intelligence. Um, so I find everything interesting and I am a staunch supporter of the liberal arts model that says an educated person should have some understanding of everything from poetry and literature and religion over here through the humanities and social sciences, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and then into the natural sciences. And one's full humanity cannot be realized until, and, and one's mind cannot be truly freed. One cannot be a free thinker without the breadth of this knowledge. And so there, there is no one particular area uh, that, that I favor over another. I think that one's major in college, I've come to think that one's major in college is very unimportant because all a major is is a doorway into all of the other disciplines.
no one consider can no one can consider themselves educated if they don't understand Plato and the life of Socrates. So you've got to read the Apology or you know the Socrates' defense of himself in 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 in, in the trial. Uh, um, uh, and so Plato is, is foundational. Uh, um, and then to balance that out, I think that people should study the great anti-Platonist Frederick Nietzsche. And, uh, and so those two are probably uh, two of my favorites, Plato and Nietzsche. Plato is the source of what we call the Socratic method, uh, which is the idea that rational beings coming together in civil discourse can arrive at certain truths about existence together through discussion, through live interaction and discourse. And that is why I think it's very important if you're going to do real philosophy to be together in the same room because you, it's hard to have Socratic inter, interlocution uh, mediated through the internet, for example. Uh, so to, to Plato, we owe the idea that rational beings can come into con conversation with one another and, and through a give and take uh, process arrive at some sort of truths uh, and uh, and the Socratic method of course is not just the foundation of philosophy and 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 the humanities but but also our legal system Nietzsche is important as the progenitor of my favorite ethical body of ethical theory, existentialism. And that is, it's up to each individual to create meaning for ourselves. No one is going to create meaning for you and hand it to you on a silver platter. There is no external source of meaning in life, religion, uh, citizenship to a certain country, because all of those things are contingent and can be uh, taken away. So, so, so Nietzsche is uh, important for coming up with this idea that to be a fully actualized individual, you have to create meaning for yourself, and only the individual is capable of doing that. That puts a huge, huge ethical burden on each one of us, because if we complain our lives have no meaning, uh, I have all these problems. I don't see the purpose in going on. Um, it's, it's our own fault.